Walter Rizzo is an Italian psychologist and author who lives in Latin America and Spain. His books are predominantly in Spanish, and they're fantastic on the topics of love and toxic relationships. His book, Amores Altamente Peligrosos, Highly Dangerous Loves, describes eight effective styles, as he calls them, or ways that toxic people behave in relationship dynamics, whose behavior and attitudes put at risk their partner's physical and psychological health. He writes that he describes these styles to help people identify them and to face them with reality so we don't fall into them. Rizzo also helps us to understand what's unacceptable in relationships if we don't want to be a victim of toxic love. He helps us identify what is contraindicated for our happiness. And I wanted to share with you a commentary in his book and these styles that he outlines within it. He prefaces the book by saying, It's not that these people don't deserve love, but rather that any emotional bond where our essential values are threatened is contraindicated for our happiness, no matter how much love we put in. These dysfunctional relationship styles drain the other person and take their vital energy. They end the other slowly or confuse the other until the point of feeling irrationally guilty or believing that suffering for love is a normal thing. Loving and being a victim are not the same thing. I'm going to summarize these eight highly toxic types so you can prevent falling into them and confront them if you have to. This is Meredith Miller, and you're listening to the Inner Integration Podcast, where you can learn the mindsets and tools to self-heal after narcissistic abuse. Riso describes the importance of accepting people as they are, but also having conditions, as long as we don't, as he says, psychologically immolate ourselves in the process. It's, quote-unquote, I accept you as you are if this doesn't imply destroying myself to make you happy. He describes a good relationship is where both people are satisfied. Both can realize their life projects and their rights aren't stepped on. Rizzo also brings up the important point that society often accepts and even exalts many of these styles, But the true manifestation of their problem will only be evident in intimate relationships and the family. I love that Riso presents realistic statistics, even though these are hard to prove scientifically due to the nature of the beast. He says personality disorders, being the extreme cases of these styles, represent 20 to 30 percent of the population. The moderate cases are much more. This is the first psychology expert I've heard give such realistic statistics to what we seem to be noticing in the world today. Rizzo talks about the danger of perismo, which is translated as something like but-ism. This is a strategy of compensation that ends up meaning something like putting up with toxicity at any cost. It sounds like he likes to flirt, but it's not that bad. She's not an expressive person, but I should understand that's the way she is. He's aggressive, but he's getting better. These, he says, are forms of self-deception and justification in the face of fear of separation. Rizzo promotes applying realism that defines how far to keep waiting for the metamorphosis of the loved one. He says, sometimes we need to put down our arms and understand that some battles aren't ours. They don't belong to us, or they just aren't good for us. Some of these styles can overlap in people. They represent the internal dynamic how some people live and love, their modus operandus, their motivations, and their cognitive affective structure. Rizzo defines an effective style as a way of processing emotional information, how we feel it, how we evaluate it, and how we incorporate it into the life of the relationship. He bases this information from scientific sources and also his own clinical practice. The first style is histrionic dramatic, or harassing love. Rizzo says, being involved with a person like this is like getting carried into a Category 5 hurricane. These people need to be the center of attention. They show excessive emotion, seductive behaviors, exaggerated care of physical appearance, 
dramatic and impressionistic attitudes, they see intimacy where there isn't. They're intense in interpersonal relationships and often end relationships in drastic and stormy ways. They will demand attention and affection 24-7, which exhausts others. This is the hallmark of this type. This demand is not based on jealousy, but on fear. Rizzo clarifies that the histrionic style is not just women, that quote-unquote hysteria is unisex in today's postmodern world. When you meet a histrionic, you'll notice a lot of seduction and emotional stalking with this type who often confuse love with desire. They want to be desired, and they lack discretion in their expression. They often appear upbeat and pleasant, but they lack emotional control and are unable to measure the consequences. They have a low tolerance to frustration and frequent attacks of rage. They are frivolous and superficial, noted by their light attitude. They always want more and better, and if they don't get a dose of it from you, they'll look for it in others. You'll notice their flirting and gallantry, which is their trap. It's more based on the seduction and not so much on sex. This type is adept at saying what the other person wants to hear to get that attention and affection. If you pull back on affection, they might have violent reactions or even make suicide attempts. Rizzo describes this type as a ticking time bomb. The histrionic type excels at theater, TV, and movie acting, where they can be the center of attention, but it's difficult to have a tranquil relationship with them and to have your boundaries respected. They tend to invade space with their demands or excessive need for attention. He says this type is especially attractive to people who are looking for someone who is extroverted and social, or for people who are looking for complications in relationships, and also people who need to reaffirm their self-esteem. Rizzo says you can negotiate with the histrionic type because they don't devalue you or end you. Their condition is based on excess and low self-esteem, not arrogance. They can provide lots of love and affection, but it tends to be shallow. It's important that they learn how to regulate their emotions and express their affection more calmly. The second style that Rizzo mentions in his book is the paranoid or guarded type, which he calls distrustful love. When you're with one of this type, you'll feel like you're guilty until proven otherwise. They're super jealous and often mount counter attacks. They never drop their guard and have beliefs like, if I give you love, you'll take advantage of me. Or, if I'm not vigilant, you'll deceive me. Rizzo says introverts and people with social anxiety tend to fall for this type, thinking that they understand each other. However, there are different motivations here. The paranoid person looks to avoid being taken advantage of. The socially anxious person wants to avoid the criticism of others. The fear of others is the glue of this couple based on social isolation. The paranoid type looks for jealousy, pain, and worry in their partners as indicators of love. Whatever you do will be used against you. They'll ask you lots of questions about your past, but they won't answer questions where they have to reveal personal information. They'll ask a lot of whys to find out about your motivations. They often don't drink alcohol because they fear losing control. They'll revise the restaurant bill many times to be sure they're not getting screwed. They'll undervalue their own success to be sure you're not after their resources. Rizzo says the paranoid types are bad fakers, and their jealousy and control quickly reveals themselves. He says getting to know a paranoid type is like taking an entry exam to the KGB. In this kind of relationship, you'll give a lot more than receive. The bottom line for relationships with paranoid types is without trust, a good relationship is impossible. The third style that Rizzo outlines is the passive-aggressive, or what he calls subversive love. Subversive means to undermine the established authority or structure. Rizzo says a relationship with a passive-aggressive person is like having a civil resistance movement at home. They will use sabotage, insurrection, indolence. Indolence is an avoidance of an activity or an expression of laziness, 
They won't follow through with commitments and promises, and they will have maddening slowness. It's more about what they're not doing than what they are doing that is so aggravating and is the hallmark of their subversion of authority tactics. They abide by the law of minimum effort. Right now, lots of you are probably realizing just how many of these types you've dated. They will exacerbate you with their forgetfulness and what he calls emotional terrorism directed to disturb the established order. Passive-aggressive types have a strong conflict with authority, both real or perceived, as this is their main trait. They're resentful and dependent at the same time. They both need and reject their partner in a push-pull dynamic. They are elusive, evasive, and provocative, as well as never satisfied. Their sabotage of their partners will be accompanied by excesses and high doses of cynicism that will drive you mad. If you try to remind them and get them to take action on their responsibilities and obligations or commitment, they'll tell you that you're controlling. They totally understand your reasoning why their behavior isn't okay. They just don't want to do it. They want control. Any sign of your optimism will become their military objective that must be crushed. They have a contagious pessimism that can lead you into deep depression and despair, and their sabotage and avoidance causes anger, learned helplessness, and a loss of control in their partners. When you're with someone who does nothing yet provokes you to react, you know you're dealing with the passive-aggressive type. Rizzo says covert aggression is their way of expressing themselves. Rizzo didn't mention in the book how this often manifests in covert narcissists who will take you into the depths of despair, loss of self-control, loss of sanity, and desperate frustration. Rizzo describes their condition as interpersonal ambivalence, as they're caught in an internal conflict where they need an authority figure for protection and security, because they see themselves as weak, yet they also need to feel free and independent from any kind of control. They can neither live with or without you, just like the song goes. In the face of dilemmas, the passive-aggressive type will resort to immobilization. Their fragility and insecurity is attractive to people who want to caretake and protect them. If you have a need to be needed, you might find that you're attracted to passive-aggressive types. Codependents who have a compulsion to want to help at any cost are often their partners. The passive-aggressive's tranquility and laziness or laissez-faire attitude is also attractive to people who don't want to be asked of anything in relationships, people who want to have relationships with little obligation and put in minimal effort without any complications. The prognosis for a relationship with a passive-aggressive type isn't good. Rizzo asks, How can you love someone like that and maintain your sanity? If you're dealing currently with a passive-aggressive type and you're working your way out, do not delegate any responsibilities to them. Do not count on them for anything. You're going to have to micromanage all responsibilities in the relationship and with your kids if you want to save your sanity. Do not respond to their provocations. There will be plenty. Just ignore them and provide them no adversity. Use assertion and defend your rights while respecting theirs. Don't own any of their mistakes and don't try to parent them or force them to mature. They will always consider you an obstacle, not love. It's not possible to have an agreement with them. With a passive-aggressive type, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you show them caring, they'll feel like it's limiting. If you show them independence, they hate you because you deprive them of the protection they need. If you want to save your sanity and physical health, do not negotiate with them. That will lead you to constant stress and emergency situations where they don't follow through. They leave you in the middle of that emergency to put out the fire. They're always against you, yet they need you and will provide no cooperation, only constant resistance. Rizzo suggests in order to discover a passive-aggressive type early on, disagree with people on the first few dates. Challenge their point of view, their opinions and attitudes in a friendly way. Notice their promises and lack of follow-through as you start to get to know them. 
The fourth style that Rizzo talks about in his book is the narcissistic or egocentric type, which he calls selfish love. With a narcissistic person, Rizzo says, you'll always feel like a satellite orbiting them. They feel special, unique, grandiose, and see others as their inferior. Their partners will suffer emotional exhaustion in order to maintain the relationship. You'll have a loss of self-esteem, feelings of loneliness, depression, lowered production at work and school, lowered self-efficacy. You'll notice your immune system is lowered and you start to get sick more often. You're going to definitely feel drained and eventually in despair. Rizzo says, it's impossible to love someone who feels they're the center of the universe. You'll end up undervaluing yourself in order to lift them up. The narcissistic type will have a need for status and power. If you have these things, they'll wear you like a trophy. The more you love them, the more you feed their grandiosity, and the more they'll distance themselves from you. You'll notice you start giving up yourself as a symptom of the alienation that you experience with them and feeling like you're disposable. Rizzo says, narcissism is not self-love, but rather self-exaltation, selfishness, and self-centeredness. He says, it's the dark side of self-esteem. Self-esteem is necessary for healthy immunity, but in the case of the narcissist, they live enclosed in their own needs and feelings and can't encompass the other. He writes, it's the demand of a self-love that blocks them from dedicating to a partner. You'll notice selfishness and manipulation when you're in a relationship with a narcissistic type as they're abusive with the management of common resources, both physical and psychological. Their selfishness destroys their ability to love another person. For a narcissist, the end justifies the means, and they will use others for self-interest. Rizzo describes the carefulness with which a narcissist selects their victim. They study the advantages that others can offer them and what they can get. They'll manipulate you through guilt, seduction, fear, and blackmail. They may even present themselves as weak or incapable in order to inspire your protection, help, or pity. Narcissists don't know how to lose, and Rizzo says this is exactly why they're so dangerous. Narcissists use grandiosity to disguise their deep sense of inferiority and their need to use their public image as a business card. They require admiration and will demand this from their partners. They'll never accept a partner who shadows them, lest their jealousy consume them. The narcissist will suck your life force out and devour your energy. If you don't agree with them, they'll perceive this as a lack of respect and fall into a narcissistic injury due to their hypersensitivity to criticism. There's no reciprocity in a relationship with a narcissist. You'll give without receiving. You'll love without being loved. You'll be manipulated and feel used like an object, which is unacceptable and unfair. When you first meet a narcissist, You'll notice their shows of power, aristocracy, glamour, style, and taste. They'll want to show off their brand name things and other stuff that they covered in an effort to say, look how cool and desirable I am. They will also be interested in your friends with status and importance. A narcissist will also present themselves in a totally opposite way of who they really are. They may present themselves as humble, sensitive, and open to personal development. Yet all your conversations will be about them, their history, their family, their kids, their work, their accomplishments, and so on. They will find your weaknesses and sweeten them before manipulating them. Narcissists will always feel like they're above the rules. The bottom line is a relationship without reciprocity is exhausting, draining, and will eventually suck the life out of you. If you value your life, this is not a healthy relationship for you. The fifth style that Rizzo writes about is the obsessive-compulsive type, or what he calls perfectionistic love. This style is all about control and perfectionism. Nothing satisfies the obsessive-compulsive person because you could always do something better. Your spontaneity is seen as a lack of self-control. The obsessive person wants rigidity, predictability, order, and is hyper-focused on details. 
They provide boring lovemaking with very little variety or improvisation because it makes them uncomfortable. They carefully keep their emotions under rigorous control. Obsessive compulsive types are very demanding and also critical of your mistakes. They will put more stock in negative things than the positive. You'll notice how they're stingy, strict, moralistic, dogmatic, formal, regulated. They show a lack of care and affection with a strong ability to convince you that their way is right. They will have a lot of discipline and high productivity at work, but have difficulty making decisions and setting priorities. Next to an obsessive compulsive type, you'll end up feeling useless, incompetent, irresponsible because you're not perfect. You'll develop a lot of anxiety and fear of making mistakes. You'll become a secondary obsessive, as Rizzo calls it, in order to meet their needs. I envision that like the character from the movie Sleeping with the Enemy, who I believe was also a psychopath, but in the obsessive compulsive way, he demanded that Julia Roberts' character keep the cans in the kitchen cupboard just so, or he would beat her. When you're in a relationship with an obsessive compulsive type, you'll start to lose your self-efficiency and become more insecure from all the judgment. You'll make mistakes for fear of making mistakes, and you'll enter into self-destructive negative spirals. You'll feel excluded in a disrespectful manner. You'll even feel ashamed of what Rizzo calls your second level, and that will lead to anger, frustration, and resentment. The obsessive-compulsive type can't give up control because they feel no one can do it better. In the series House of Flowers, the super obsessive-compulsive controlling character Paulina is sitting in a therapist's office, and he asks her, what would happen if you didn't control everything for everyone? Do you think they would be able to handle it? And she goes, oi, no. An obsessive-compulsive type will kill the joy in the home and a relationship. Your relationship will become super rational because they see emotions as a lack of control due to their emotional rigidity. They simply can't express their feelings. Obsessive-compulsive types often have low libido and difficulty reaching orgasm because they can't let go. Obsessive-compulsive types tend to attract people who feel useless and seek someone who can handle everything, but eventually that initial relief will become control, criticism, and fear of failure will increase. They also attract people who look for someone to get them on the good path in life, This is usually someone who lived out of control and in excess, who's looking to settle down, to make amends for past behavior, and get rid of their guilt, like a form of self-redemption. Obsessive types also attract people looking for responsible, trustworthy partners, because they project this trust. They are usually faithful and responsible for people who look for commitment, but the partners end up psychologically devastated due to the mental torture and the obsessive-compulsive demands that are ten times bigger than what they give. It's hard to live with someone who has unreachable standards. These demands of the obsessive-compulsive type will also have a touch of indignation, Rizzo says, as they think that they're right. They'll be dogmatic and have a hard time accepting that their beliefs need a reevaluation. A relationship with an obsessive type will be stagnant love caught in routine and normality. It won't flow. Some partners will start to identify with the obsessive-compulsive type and become an obsessive person to make the relationship work. Their self-deception will sound like, it's not all that bad. If you set boundaries on their perfectionism, Rizzo says to expect a counter-attack. This is like declaring war with your spontaneity and unpredictability or improvisation or even making changes in your daily life and home. These things will cause quote-unquote existential dimensions of the crisis because the obsessive-compulsive type will be facing their irrational fears. Rizzo suggests to find a middle path in order to create constructive approaches with the obsessive-compulsive type where you're not giving up yourself but also not provoking them. He says they suffer because of their way of being, unlike the narcissist or antisocial types. So the obsessive-compulsive type is more motivated to get help. Their exaggerated emotional self-control is not for lack of love. With some professional help, their need for order, stinginess, and expressive control can be reduced, 
and with patience, you might be able to make the relationship work with someone who might be a good catch. The sixth style that Riza writes about is the antisocial or fighting type, what he calls violent love. Rizzo describes this style as a form of anti-love and a basic badness that blocks a loving approach to relationship. The antisocial type will violate social norms. They'll be impulsive, irresponsible, and sometimes criminal doing illegal activities. Rizzo describes a relationship with an antisocial type as surviving a predator and a threat for anyone. All of them will bring interpersonal destruction and objectify others. The antisocial type is manipulative. They'll cry, ask for forgiveness, and make promises of change when you threaten to leave. They'll have non-conventional sexual proclivities and demands, which you might give in to despite not enjoying it, because it's the only time when you feel a sense of affection from them or even closeness. Antisocial types don't know how to love. They also don't understand others' pain. They just want to have fun and not be bored. They have zero responsibility toward others and always objectify people. They see people as objects to take advantage of, exploit, and they do it with a lack of compassion. In extreme cases, they have a pleasure in others' suffering. Antisocial types feel contempt for others as they exhibit cruel and abusive behaviors, both physical and psychological. The selfishness of a narcissist is about their grandiosity and feeling special. Rizzo says the selfishness of the antisocial is about me and no one else. I'm alone facing life and also the survival of the fittest. Rizzo describes they'll hang people on a keychain like a thing. They'll not look for approval from others. People are seen as a needless waste or disposable unless they can be used temporarily. Antisocial types are cold-hearted. They see people as property. If someone disrespects their partner, they might beat up the other person, but not because they care about their partner. But rather, as Rizzo describes, one of them told him, it was like someone had keyed his car. His woman was his property. Some antisocial types appear to love some people, but this love is based on usefulness and lacking sensitivity. They are ultimately destructive to everyone. Use is not love. Rizzo writes that predators only respect other predators. Antisocial types feel they must survive at any cost. Many of them believe victims deserve it because they're weak. You'll notice this mentality in groups where racial supremacy is promoted. They feel they have a right to crush others as they see fit. Antisocial types have a delirium of omnipotence and total domination. A narcissist will devalue you and tell you that you're worth less than them. They'll do that directly or indirectly through their actions, whereas an antisocial type will despise you and tell you that you are nothing. Objectification is their life philosophy. They will degrade you and crush your inner personal drives. Antisocial types often have a high IQ, even though they're impulsive. They often premeditate their manipulations. Victims of antisocial types lose their vital energy and become conformist, resigning to their luck. They develop a dissociation where they know they can escape, but their body doesn't react. They develop learned helplessness and hopelessness. They lose their own decision-making power. The victim, as he writes, will internalize the condition as the object. Antisocial types exhibit no guilt or remorse. They have no commitment or obligations to others. They also have an inability to self-doubt what they do and say. They own zero self-responsibility. Rizzo differentiates the passive-aggressive rebelliousness as a decision of protest of the interference of the other. The antisocial irresponsibility is not an opposition, but an absence of conscience. They don't decide to be irresponsible. They just are. The passive-aggressive has a dependent side that pushes them to seek security in others. The antisocial type doesn't look for security in others, but rather a monopoly of power. Antisocial types can be especially charming, seductive, and play upon so-called 
hero values, such as strength, bravery, and the love of adventure. They can be attractive to your personal lack of power if you're looking for someone to defend you. If you feel weak, you will seek a protector or someone sure of themselves. Rizzo said, the higher socioeconomic status version is simply a more elegant presentation of the same thing. If you need someone brave to admire, you might be attracted to the antisocial lack of fear and their living life at the limits. If you need to feel strong emotions, you could be attracted to an antisocial type as they have a low tolerance for boredom and need to feel strong emotions to feel alive. They do extreme behaviors in order to feel more. They have an addiction to danger and to intense emotions. Rizzo calls it love at 100 kilometers and in free fall. The antisocial type has an incapacity for self-control. Antisocial types feel proud to be like they are and they enjoy it. They do not change at all. A relationship with an antisocial type is, as Rizzo says, assisted suicide and comes at a very high cost. A healthy relationship with one is impossible if you want to live a dignified life. Run in the opposite direction. He writes, a relationship is only possible between two antisocial types or an antisocial and a borderline type as they both seek intensity. The seventh style that Rizzo writes about is the schizoid hermit type, or what he calls indifferent love. Rizzo says, to isolate oneself from one's partner is a silent form of aggression. It's as destructive or more than the violent love. Like the antisocial type, this is the maximum expression of indifference. The schizoid's type of indifference is mortal because it's not based on ego, like the narcissist, nor on the fight for survival, like the antisocial, but rather based on the essence of non-bonding, where there's an absence of emotion for no reason other than the absence. He describes a relationship with one of these types like a black hole. Schizoid types have a radical need for independence. No one reaches their depths. Being alone is their adopted way of life. Creating emotional distance is how they relate to others. They exhibit indecision, apathy, and lack of commitment. In fact, they'll avoid topics of commitment in marriage. They get some benefit from a partner, but they prefer to keep them at a distance. Rizzo says the schizoid style is a passive-aggressive style that has quote-unquote overcome the conflict of security versus independence in favor of autonomy. It's impossible to connect with the schizoid type because of their exaggerated need for freedom. Reasonable independence is one thing. Another is the addiction to non-attachment. In the case of the schizoid, independence becomes isolation, reclusion, and incommunication because of their negative vision of others. They feel people are controlling and invasive, and they see love as a form of slavery. Rizzo writes, Loving a schizoid is like hugging the nothing. It's like quicksand. The more you love them, the more you sink into the loneliness because the more they will pull away. This reminds me of the nothing from the never-ending story. They even used the image of quicksand in the movie. Rizzo says the schizoid type often like cyber love and cyber sex, as well as long-distance relationships because there are no commitments and no one really gets to know them. It's easy to lie in that arena without getting caught. They prefer masturbation to sex because it's non-invasive. Rizzo describes their condition as emotional illiteracy and a lack of empathy. Their lack of empathy is called alexithymia, which is the inability to process emotional information, their own or others. He says, to be with someone like this is to be alone. Indifference is a torture that kills in slow motion and can take you to the limits of desperation. He warns us that at the beginning, the schizoid type won't appear like a black hole and no one suspects their inability to give and receive affection. They seem respectful and mysterious. Their defects only emerge when the so-called virus of love is triggered, which he says usually takes about six months. The rejection and coldness are only perceived as you fall in love with them. 
The schizoid types are attractive when you're looking for someone who respects your space, or when you're seeking love that's a challenge to be conquered. Rizzo says a relationship with a schizoid type is not possible, as living in indifference and abandonment goes against human nature. The closer you get, the more they'll pull away. The eighth and final style that Rizzo writes about in his book is the borderline or unstable type, what he calls chaotic love. This type is impulsive, emotionally unstable, whimsical, insecure, and self-destructive, with a tendency towards addiction and other dysfunctional patterns. They're unpredictable and explosive. A relationship with a borderline type is more chaotic and maddening every day. Rizzo describes them as a supernova. They have rage attacks, drastic ups and downs, intense jealousies, and often alcoholism. They often don't want help. They will explode, then ask for forgiveness, and that cycle repeats over and over. The borderline type has a contradictory nature. They will love and hate you. They'll be tender and violent. They have a black and white perception and thinking. This often shows up in women and whether they feel secure and loved or not based on if they're remembering the positive or negative aspects of their partner. In men, it often shows up as feeling successful or feeling like a failure and they will treat their partner with irritability and reject their affection if they don't feel good about themselves in that moment. Their internal states are constantly changing and you will never know who you will find when you see them from one day to the next. Rizzo describes a relationship with a borderline type as high-risk love, as it's unpredictable and surprising, like living on the edge of a razor. He said for this reason the antisocial types like them, because they're like a box of surprises and that amuses them. Plus, they both tend to seek intense emotional experiences. Rizzo says at the beginning of the relationship with the borderline, you'll notice the seduction, extravagance, lots of emotions and fluctuations, a sincerity and openness, and often a sex drive, unlike the histrionic type. Borderline types have a fragmented identity and a lack of sense of self. Rizzo writes, knowing who we are and where we're going in life is important in order to have a mature love. Borderline types fear being alone in abandonment, yet they also fear intimacy. They have a low self-esteem and don't feel worthy of love. They have no self-love. They want to maintain a relationship of dependency, yet they lack the inner resources to do it. This is what causes a vicious cycle of interpersonal relationships. When the borderline's partner can't reach their standards in order to feel totally secure, they're triggered into rage, aggression, self-harm, identity crises, infidelities, and addictions. The partner naturally distances themselves, which is then interpreted by the borderline that they're not worthy of love. When you're in a relationship with a borderline type, you'll end up feeling impotent and powerless. Rizzo suggests that the borderline type always needs therapy. He says it's possible with therapy to go from a tornado to a tropical storm that's more manageable. With therapy, they can get to the point where there are no more devastating tsunamis, but there will definitely be flooding. He says this will most show up in their intimate relationships, as those are the Achilles tendon of the borderline, where their major problems come out. He says it's your call whether you want to stay in a relationship like this or not. To summarize, Rizzo says healthy love is focused on human dignity and favors the development of human potential. These eight styles of love have anti-values that oppose normal development of affection. Knowledge of these themes is important to avoid them, but this also requires emotional maturity. He suggests to go slow, to take time to observe and think to love yourself enough to not let yourself be objectified or to suffer in the name of love. Rizzo writes, Loving isn't suffering, and we have the right to be happy. Dignity and self-esteem should never be negotiated, because even love has limits. If you read Spanish, I highly recommend this book, and if not, then I hope you enjoyed this summary. I found Rizzo's content really valuable and plan to read more of his books to bring more of his ideas to you in the future. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Inner Integration Podcast. 
I hope you learned something today that helps you see from a new perspective so you can take new action and transform your life after narcissistic abuse. Remember, you are enough, you matter, and you got this. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to get automatic updates on new podcast episodes as they're released. Visit us online at www.innerintegration.com where you'll get a free three-part video course when you enter your name and email on the homepage. Get loads of more free content to help you heal after narcissistic abuse on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Big hug to you.